What a great, what a great song, amen? How many of you here have worries today? Issues, disappointments, shortcomings. Maybe we've been looking at them too long. Maybe we should change our focus and magnify not the problems, but magnify Christ in our lives. Amen. The other song they sang, May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. May your bad days prove that God is good. May your whole life show that God is good. Amen. Would you clap your hands for the Lord one more time. Please say hi to the people around you and you may be seated. Amen. Wonderful worship, guys. Really, really good. Amen. Come on, clap your hands for the Lord. Galing. We can go home now, actually, you know. Amen. Um, we're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to call um, a good friend and a current, not so long ago, addition to, to the church, um, all the way from uh, New Valley. And we've asked him to spend more time here with us in Alabang. May you please welcome Pastor John Del Rosario. Good morning, everyone. Maraming salamat, Pastor Luigi. Uh, it's such a privilege to be entrusted with the pulpit today. It's always humbling. It's always exciting to make much of the name of the Lord and to explain more about the gospel. But first of all, it's, it's in line with what we're going to be talking about today. I want to honor this man. I want to honor you, Pastor Luigi. Thank you for being a father to us. Thank you for being a bastion of God's truth for us. And thank you for being a vanguard of showing us how it is to worship and honor our Father in heaven despite our troubles. Maraming maraming salamat. Pwede pong palakpakan natin ang Panginoon for the life of Pastor Luigi. My wife and I are so excited to finally get to meet you. Uh, you guys are more beautiful in person and handsome, more handsome in person and we are so thrilled. We hope to get to meet you, uh, meet more of you and uh, thank you Pastor Luigi for inviting us to, uh, to help, help out in what the Lord is doing here in, uh, in Alabang. Um, I'd like to read of scripture today because we, we want to make a statement that we are, everything that we are holding on to is based on this, the compass for our souls. God's word, and in it is, is what we find the key, the key point of all of Scripture is the gospel, the compass for our hearts. I want to be able to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 5. For the sake of context, let me read the first three verses and then verse 16. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 1. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today. And you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all, who are all of us here alive today. And verse 16, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This is the word of the Lord. Um, very, uh, very quickly, let me tell you that we have had, like, 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 may, like many of you, we've had a busy week, a busy week and a half. And my wife and I had been afforded a couple of days out in a farm somewhere south of here, and it was beautiful. It was like a, a, a family farm, and uh, it was fertile land. There were groves of bananas and mangoes, and uh, there, were, there was uh, atis also, but the fruits in season were mangoes and 
Makopa. And it was so fertile that they had uh, been able to raise livestock. There were horses and there were geese and, and there, there was one sheep, uh, and so a few goats and some cows. And they were able to raise some, uh, some vegetables of their own as well. It's a beautiful time, beautiful place that God had afforded for us to just bond and talk and pray and think. Think of what's in our future and think of what we are going to be talking about today. Considering that this is the kind of land that the Israelites were about to enter in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The promised land, which is Canaan. Pastor Luigi had asked for me to embark on a series, and as you well know, you probably know, that we are into our fifth installment of the Ten Commandments. Today we'll be talking about the fifth commandment. Um, consider that, 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 that the commandments were not given in Egypt. It was not given while they were still slaves. God had first rescued them out of Egypt, and, and Moses was used by God to, be, to lead them out uh, in what is called the Exodus, and then he gave the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments aren't unto salvation. These aren't the things that we, we need to do as best as we can. Hopefully, we meet the, we meet the quota and get the, the, the point so that we can be saved. No, God saved them first and gave them the Ten Commandments. So it gives them, God, the Ten Commandments are given for an entirely different reason to what we have been indoctrinated in. We thought, do, do this the best that we can, and when we die and when we get to heaven, let's hope for the best. It's like you don't know when you've met it or not. It's like it's the, uh, it's the NBA is probably something that you're watching today. It's like when you're there and you're saying, you know what, you're on the line. Let's let this free throw decide it. Kahit na sobrang Steph Curry, kakakabahan ka pa rin, sala, tapos. But the Ten Commandments weren't given uh, for that purpose. It's given as an instruction manual for God's people. God's people is going to be made into a nation, God's nation, and it's like a constitution. A charter for how it is to live a rich, satisfying, and full life with God as the people of God. Imagine, these people, the, the, the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, 430 years. And this generation that had been led by God through Moses had known nothing but slavery. They were born into slavery. And now they were set free. And they had no idea of what God had finally, been, God, God had finally afforded them. Freedom is something that they've never had in the, in the past. So they need to be taught. So they need to be taught about things that you don't need to do, need to do this anymore. You, you don't need to be forced to do this anymore. Here are the things you need to recognize. Here are the things that you need to, to respect. And, but, but generally, here are things that you need to know so that you can savor free life with God in the promised land. These are guidelines that He has given to us for the common Good. We find this in the Old and the New Testaments for the common good, for people's benefit, for our safety, for our well-being, and ultimately for our joy. Um, when we went to, to Batangas, we drove on, on the road. You probably drove here. Do you know that you are essentially driving in faith that people will respect the laws of the land? That it will be safe for you to, to, to pass a green light and that they will stop when it's red on their end. By and large, it is, it is a picture of how commandments work. It is for our safety. We, we drove south and there was this patch of land in one town that is newly asphalted. So there are no markings on, on, on the ground. But by the common grace of God, there's something that's indoctrinated in us that... Generally, people stayed on the right side of the road and we don't bang into one another. Made, made me think, this is how we ought to think about the Ten Commandments. What if no one respected the laws? It'll be chaos. No guarantee for you to get, for you to get home safely if you just went out to get groceries. But on the other hand, what if everybody respected this law, these laws? Well, it would be a wonderful place, a safe place to live. And this is what we need to, this is the lens by which we need to see why God gave the Ten Commandments. If you acknowledge these laws, you'll cherish and appreciate everything that God had given us, which is a relationship with Him and a relationship with one another. But if you don't, 
If you ignore these design parameters as, set, as designed by God, these fences of protection, it will not go well with you. You'll never understand what true life in God is all about. Today, like I told you, we're, we're going to be talking about the fifth commandment. If I were to ask you, we're going to be talking about the, ten comma the, the fifth commandment today. What do you think the approach would be? Parenting. Everybody would say parenting. Parenting is biblical. We can worship the Lord with parenting. It is important. It is practical. But given the text and given the context, this could very well be a bit of teaching the right doctrine from the wrong text. I wouldn't want to do that. Let's, let's try to, to, to preach parenting from Ephesians 6 or something. But this, this is entirely something bigger than just parenting. Hindi ko minamaliit yung parenting. But this is so, so, so much bigger than we think. Parenting is, it's talking about parents' duty to children. But this is essentially talking about the reverse. Children, as it were, their duty towards parents. We need to ask this of this. Why do we find the fifth commandment as the fifth commandment? The same, the same question you need to be asking. Why do I find this particular favorite part of the Bible, what is its context? We need to do this work today. There are two places that we can find the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Exodus chapter 20 is around seven to eight weeks after the, the Exodus. Deuteronomy is four, almost 40 years later and about to enter into the land as a people in the new land that they are to take as a nation. Um, Exodus 31 would tell us that um, parang itong picture na to, uh, yung pinakita natin kanina, there were, there are two tablets. When we think of the, of the Ten Commandments, we think of two tablets, right? It's Exodus 31 says there were two tablets that Moses came down with as chiseled in by the, hand, the, by the finger of God. We think that it's divided in two parts. Well, let me tell, tell you that the two tablets are two copies of the same thing. It was done in duplicate. This is very typical of, of, of covenants, which we read in, in, in the first three verses that God had made with the people. It's a covenant. One, one party, each party would have a copy of the covenant. So there were two. But Moses brought it down with, with him. One finds its way to the Ark of the Covenant, which will find its way in the tabernacle, then the temple. And the other will be to the people, stewarded by the, by the priests who will study it, and to use the, 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 the Bible's words for it, who will remember it, the stipulations of the covenant. So there are two tablets, but in each tablet, there are two tables. Okay, tablets, now tables. Um, historically, this is what Christians believe. The first part of the table is our vertical responsibility to God, and the second part of the table is our horizontal responsibility to other people. And there's evidence for this. There are a few places in Scripture Luke 18, when he was talking to the rich, rich, rich young ruler, um, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul in Romans chapter 13, he listed the commandments that only came from the second table. So there's a second table, there's a first table. And apparently Jesus holds on to this view as well, that there are two parts of the commandments. When he says in Matthew chapter 22, and he said to him, so uh, a lawyer Pharisee was asking Jesus, which is the greatest commandment out of the ten? He said, I can't give you one. I need to give you two. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, basically with all you got. Quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. It flows from it. It's evidence. If you claim the first commandment, this should be in place. This should be manifest. A, sec a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Two parts of the commandments. Two tables of the ten words of God. Why am I telling you this? The fifth commandment then is a transition from the first table to the second table. And you're saying, oh, that's interesting. And you're pointing it to us. Why? Here's why. The first four is for God. And the foundation is the first commandment. Everything flows from the first commandment. The first commandment is about idolatry. First commandment is about you shall not worship false gods. Idolatry. Asking for singular devotion. The second commandment flows from that. 
he, it's saying you shall not worship God falsely. You're going to the right God, but you're basically making Him into your own image instead of the other way around. That's still also idolatry. The third flows from the second. Using the name of the Lord God in vain. It's not just using it in, in patterns of speech or expletives, but it's basically saying we're on the same team. But what you're really meaning is that God is in your team instead of you being on God's team. It's you who holds the agenda. That's the third commandment. Still idolatry. The fourth is the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Rest. Because anxiety and frustration and anger, they're telltale signs of idolatry. So foundationally, the first is key to the first table. Then we get to the fifth commandment. Let me say right now that our inability to honor community fathers and mothers had caused all of the problems that we know today, bringing about this broken community. But there's hope. Because God gave the Ten Commandments to His people for His redemptive purposes, knowing fully well that sin had already been introduced into the equation and had already started its destructive work. God, sin is not beneath God. Sin is able to reverse, God is able to reverse the effects of sin. And this is what the Ten Commandments are able to do. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long and that it may go well with you. There's a redemptive feel to that. Paul calls this a promise. It's not a promise of mortality. So if you obey your parents, you'll gain points. And then and by this, you'll get one more year in your life. That doesn't work that way. It's really talking about it's the quality of life that we live despite our sin. If we recognize authority, if we respect authority, if we look out for one another, if we work for the common good, we contribute to having our society inch a little bit closer to how God intended society in the first place, despite our sin. It considers the normative authority as well. So it reads, so that, it might, so that your days may be long, that it might go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. For example, every one of us had had, had a first job. If you were in your, on your first job, and on that particular Saturday, they're saying, oh, we need to meet the customer's deadlines, and sorry, it's your first day. All the team needs to work overtime this weekend. And you're saying, oh, may long ride kami. They'll be frustrated if I'm not there. I organized it, so I can't come. You know what will happen if you say that? Let me put it this way. Short life in the land, it will not go well with you. What if you were driving and, and you got caught beating the red light? A police enforcer, a traffic enforcer, just pulled you over with this pickup truck and said, you know why, why I pulled you over? Um, I beat the red light. Yes, license and registration, please. You know what? I don't want to give you my license and registration. Why don't you give me your license and registration? Because you guys beat the red, red light all the time. That's not, that might be true, but that's not the wise thing to say. When you say that, short life in the land, it will not go well with you. It, it recognizes authoritative figures in our society that we need to somehow deal with and respect for the glory of God. I'm just trying to make light of this, but there's a pushback in our hearts because things haven't really been going well with us. Ethics has faded. It's changed and morphed. Good manners and right conduct are, are a thing of the past. Um, corruption is still very much with us. We're still wary that people who abuse authority will victimize us. We, uh, we, I love driving, but if, if you've driven elsewhere, aside from this country, you'd say the driving situation in this country is bad. All around the world, if you flash a light, it's a sign that I'm yielding. You go first. For some reason, here in our country, it's me, 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 me. Don't even think about it. Stop, I'm going first. Me first. And I think that's just the culture that we have here today. I love our country. I pray for our country. I pray for our president. But just telling you matter of factly something that you already know. We've become so desensitized and got, gotten so used to this. Sometimes it gets messy when you get too frustrated. 
when you compare it to other countries. But here's what we need. It's, it's true all over the world. They have different messes. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in a bit. But think of all of the ways that it isn't working well for us. And see how at the root, it's the culture of me first. When Scripture is saying, look out for one another, put them first. Work for the common good. That's our problem. So you see, the Ten Commandments are still very much so important to Christians, even in 2022. How has it gotten this way? Before you start pointing fingers to people who you're certain are culpable all over again, we're all to blame. I'm to blame. You're to blame. At the root, our collective culpability, our collective guiltiness of not honoring community fathers and mothers over the years, over the decades, have exponentially gotten us to this situation we have today. Instead of working for the common good, instead of looking out for one another, we've chosen to put ourselves first. So how does this commandment work? How does this... Indulge me as I, as I discuss how this works very briefly. So the, the fifth commandment is, is said to be the, uh, the, the, the family that is the basic unit of society. Hopefully you voted. I believe it, honor, it honors God when we participate in that way. Because people with righteousness do help. God can definitely use people with righteousness. But let me say this. No society rises above the value of the family. We're all hin hanging on to, sana ito, sila yung malagay sa posisyon. But this, this is saying, no, you need to look at the basic unit of society first. You can't talk about all of them. What are you doing in yours? I've been thinking about bringing this up, but this week, in Texas, there's yet another shooting of, of so an 18-year-old shooter killed 21 children. And people in the U.S. media are asking interesting things. What could be going on in the mind? What could he have been going through, an 18-year-old, to lead him to do this thing? People who have done studies in the social sciences have been saying it for ages the best predictor of whatever, of, of whether or not someone stays in school, of whether or not someone st get, stays out of jail, of whether or not someone would end up promiscuous or, or go into drugs, the best predictor of that is what happens in the home. You've heard the saying, it doesn't happen. The fruit with, will not fall far from the tree. Our children will think like us. Our children will Will, will talk like us, our children will work like us, our children will drive like us, our children will relate to other people like us, our children will have the same level of discipline like us, our children will have the same level of commitment to the church like us, our, our children will have the same reliance on God like us. My question to you is, will it be a good thing or a bad thing for you? Every one of us has this decision and it's not too late. We can do this right now. We can talk about it in our families and make resolutions for the gray, for, 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 for the uh, for, for the for the glory of the Lord, trusting in the grace of the Lord, so that as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord starting from today. There are exceptions. Good kids coming from bad families and bad kids coming from good good families, but by and large. If you are not prayerful, they will not be prayerful. It just doesn't happen that way. It's, it's not important enough to be done in the family. So why should I be prayerful if mom and dad aren't? If you are a gossip, if you bash people in government, you're, there's a song about this, The Cats in the Cradle, your son will, be t will turn out to be just like you. It will not go well with us if we just to tolerate this. Augustine would say something like this. If anyone fails, I have a, a quote from Augustine for you. 
If anyone fails to honor his parents, is there anyone he will spare? Think about that. If you want to live a life of you first in driving, the first place to start is you driving respectfully, honorably, even when no one's looking. Do it as worship unto the Lord, and you'll surprise yourself. One day, you'll just say, wow, I'm just giving and just allowing people to, 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 to go ahead of me, which was never there before. Now, to honor community fathers and mothers, we start with the family. I was thinking of saying this to you today. This is very difficult. I would say it anyways. The fifth commandment is the hardest commandment to obey. Here's why. When we read it, it's, it says, honor your father and your mother. And that's it. It doesn't give any ifs or but only if they do this. There's no inaction or no action that they can do that would, that would allow for them to, to be rendered unworthy of honor. It's as if parents and community leaders are worthy of honor just by being there. Because God who is sovereign had instituted them to be there. Now, it needs to work out in some way for us. Honor is one of the heaviest words in the Bible. It's the, it's the word kabod. Honor is sometimes translated as glory, which literally means weight. It's heavy. It has matter. It matters more. To, to give honor is to consider something significant, to, to consider something worthy of your attention and your allegiance. allegiance. Def it definitely works out in a way that we aren't supposed to be talking disrespectfully to our parents, not talking disrespectfully behind their backs, or, or, or just not minding their opinions as not significant. Um, something that you probably already know, we're no longer in the culture of you're old, so you're more wise and you're more deserving of culture, of, of, of respect. That, that is a thing of the past. Now, it's popular culture will say, you're old and you take a back seat. Wouldn't it then be so wonderfully countercultural if the world can look in and perhaps go in a place like Without Walls Alabang? And see how parents, the elderly, are honored. We start there. How are we doing with this? Some, some people are, are having trouble because they're asking this question. It's a valid question. Does honor mean obey? Does honor mean obey? Well, Colossians 3.20 is something that I need to bring in. It says, children, obey your parents in all things because that pleases the Lord. And I would say it this way, obedience generally is something that should be the mark of a Christian. But something that you, you and I already know, our parents are not perfect. Some, some parents aren't even in the Lord. Matthew tw chapter 22, if I could bring it up again, the way that it's written is one depends on the other. One is flowing from the other. Love the Lord your God with all you got. And as proof of that, love, honor your parents. Love your neighbor. So here's how, here's how I, I, I would say it. If our parents or our community fathers and mothers, our authorities, government officials, anyone else, forbids something that God commands or commands something that God forbids, we honor the Lord. We disobey for the glory of God. Thankfully, we're a free country, but we need to be able to do it honorably as Christians. Important to talk about also is the world is broken. The world's broken out there because the world's broken. Our hearts are broken in here. Our parents are not perfect. And I share in almost everybody that we have had the experience of our parents saying something to us that we just hope and wish we could forget. It still affects us today. Because for some of you, it's still happening today. 
how are we to go about honoring them? And again, make your own conclusions on how to apply this to all other uh, cultures, but this is pressing front and center to many of you today. I sympathize with you, but, but, but I bring about Jesus' situation. Imagine Jesus, his father and mother were not perfect. I mean, Joseph and Mary, his adoptive parents, they were not perfect. And he was. But Scripture would tell us that he honored them. He found a way to honor them. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And this, I don't know how that worked out. But by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will find a way to honor God and honor your parents. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. So I would say, honor them. Find a way to honor them in your honoring of God. And this could happen. Your parents could treasure your loving them and ask the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts as he had been working in yours. That's where we start. We forgive, we serve, and we love them. And I'd expect honor to radiate to all of the relationships and all of the other authorities from this. Let me, let me say a very quick word about authority in, out there, outside of the home. Paul writes in line with what the fifth commandment is saying, 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. For the purpose of somehow, despite our sin, that we could inch in our society towards how God designed society to be. That's our responsibility. Praying for the community parents. That's our accountability to the Lord. But they're not doing their, 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 their job well. That, that's their accountability to the Lord. As a Christian, you need to take relief and comfort and confidence in the fact that God is well able to change. His, his ear is not deaf to hear. To hear. His arm is not too, de- too, too, too short to save. He can change people's hearts in a day. And also the fact that ultimately no one gets away with anything. For the glory of God, if we trust God, we will honor and pray for these people. That's where we start. Let me ask you the question. When was the last time that we prayed for our president? Have you ever done this? You don't see that qualification here. I'm going to tell you something very personal. So lahat ng binoto ko in the past, wala pong nanalo. But the fact that I participated, I prayed through it, my wife and I talked deep into the night, the night before the voting process, we prayed through it, we considered, Lord, this is just one vote, but in your hands you can do things. I think God was glorified in that we participated in it. And the way that we voted, God was glorified. But we want to glory, we are, we are intent in glorifying God now to say the incumbent president is our president. Just like all of the other times. Did I do that perfectly? No. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit works through my wife and... <laughs> And leads me to repentance. It's my problem if she points out as magagalit ako, which is what happens to many of us. Our responsibility is to pray for our president. Otherwise, my friend, you have a heart issue. And that's a big thing. Are you grieving? Are you gloating? When you're either of these two, two, two parties, you're forgetting the true sovereign who actually charts the courses of nations. In Isaiah, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, there was a good king. Israel had a spate of good things. Good, bad, good, bad, good, good, bad, 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 good, bad, good, bad. Uzziah was one of the good kings. And then he died of leprosy. He was a perfect king, but he was a good king better than most. But then Uzziah says, oh no, kita ako sa mga susunod, naku na, sa kangkungan tayo pupulutin na ito. Lord! Then you know what happened? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. (laughs) 
God demotes His plan. I know that's a weak way to put it, but He demotes His plan so that we can make significant contributions to it, whether as Christians or non-Christians. It's just the way that He chooses to work in His benevolence. But take heart. God never relinquishes control. You see it all over Scripture. Proverbs 21 would say, the king's heart is a stream of water in his hand. He directs it wherever he wills it. God directs the hearts of kings. Isaiah 44 says, do you know who he used to free the, the, the exiles in Mesopotamia from the hands of Nebuchadnezzar? Cyrus, who wasn't even a Christian, but God called him to be a shepherd. He's a shepherd and he shall fulfill my purposes. Ang pinaka-kontrabita sa Old Testament si Pharaoh. But Romans 9 verse 17 would tell us, For God, through Scripture, would say of Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So whether we have a Christian president or not, just we need to work out. We are citizens of heaven, Philippians 3.20 tells us. But it should work out in the fact that we are good citizens of this nation involved in politics, involved in suffrage, that we look at the people who occupy the Senate and the Congress and, and the presidential seat. But we, our look, our gaze does not stop there. We need to find solace and confidence in the fact that the Lord is on the throne and, and we will not be forsaken. Actually, these verses instill confidence in me and there's another one Daniel 2 21 he says he's the one who sets up kings and he's the one who deposes kings I have a picture for your mind think of a pole and there's a turtle on top of that and the turtle is saying just follow me look at where I am you didn't get up there by yourself someone put you there God put the put the leaders in our in the nations in our companies in our churches he's the one who puts them in their place Christian or not, and we need to honor God by honoring them. So in light of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, many things, including the voting process, God's responsibility, God's providence, God's sovereignty, and man's responsibility. Voting is really a heart issue. If God can work with anybody anyways, I don't think God is glorified in the fact, you know, I won't bother. God is glorified in you participating. But I think God is also glorifying in the why rather than the who. He doesn't want a decision to be made by you. He wants your heart. Where is your heart when you voted? Where is your heart when you say these things about the government? Where is your heart when you talk about people in, in authority and your parents? And the same thing, in light of honor your father and mother, biological or community, this is also a heart issue. But how then are we enabled to obey this? Just let me take a, a quick, we need to end in the same way that we always end. The motivation, the power by which we're able to do this, the restorative community, this community. Very important in God's redemptive plan. I need to admit to you that what I did to you, what I did was legal, okay? But I used land very, very loosely. I applied it to what we have. We're stewarding. And it is there. I, it is in Romans 13. But land in the Old Testament is, let me put it this way. Israel was God's people. And land was the promised land, Canaan. Now in the New Testament, the church is God's people. We don't really have land. Land isn't the Philippines. We pray for the Philippines. But where's our land? We need to answer that so that we can have confidence in actually obeying not just the fifth commandment, but all of God's commandments. The most important contribution of the Jews to the world is thinking of history as linear. Everyone in the world would... would live by, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's why it's me first because I'm going to make the most out of everything that we have while I still live. But being linear, there's a beginning, there's an end. We owe 
fairy tales to this. Once upon a time, there was a king. He was a good king. But then the witch, and they lived happily ever after. That's linear. And that's how the Jews think. And that's how we as Christians ought to think. In the Bible, all, all from Moses to Paul and, and, and John, they're talking about rehearsing the story. Reminding us where we were. Slaves. We are sinners. We're slaves. Where we are. The author of Hebrews actually tell us that we're still in the wilderness. This is not the promised land. You might have grown to like this place, but this is not home. And where we're going, where we're going is to an eternal promised land. Please don't tune out to me now. We were just singing that in the last song. We need to know the doctrine in our hearts and have this, have this galvanized had, had this be galvanized in our hearts so that we ha can have poise and composure in the brokenness of our world. We need a restorative community. A restorative community like the church community. For what? To remind us of this story. If you have been in church, our church or other churches, and there's no transformation, you're still angry. You're still impatient. You're still frustrated you're still anxious here's what's been happening you haven't put yourself in a position where you can invite somebody from your church community to be a formative authority in your life to remind you and calibrate your mind to the story to where we're going this is not the end all be all what's experiencing it doesn't rhyme because it's not finished yet but we're getting there this thing that we've been singing, this thing that I've been telling you, this is all in our future. We need a restorative community. What is the story? Consider the brokenness in the world and our attachment to it. We're all attached because we're indelibly and inordinately affected by it. Grieving ka o nagse-celebrate ka. How do we honor our fathers and mothers then? We need a new attachment. We need an expulsive power for a new affection to a new father. Just one last bit of history. Israel has many names. In Isaiah, he had been, she had been called the bride. She had been called the beloved. But when Moses was speaking God's words to Pharaoh, Israel had been referred to as God's son. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 to 23 would say, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. This idea of sonship is actually a thread that goes throughout all of the Bible. You see it here in Hosea 11 verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. You can actually see this extend to the New Testament when, the, when Matthew writes in recounting the experience of Joseph and Mary as they were fleeing Egypt with the infant Jesus, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. So the story flows from the Old to the New Testament. So Israel was God's first son and Jesus was God's first son also, the first begotten son. Later, we see Jesus passing through the water of baptism. Just like Israel, God's son had once done. We see Jesus going to uh, the, the, the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Matthew 4, Luke 4. Just like Israel, God's son, had once done in the wilderness. He goes up to the mountain to meet up with God in the transfiguration. Just like Israel, God's son, had once done in Sinai. He celebrates a Passover meal just like Israel, God's son, had once done. What we see in all of the gospel accounts about Jesus is that he had perfect obedience to the father as a son. He perfectly honored. In fact, Jesus actually honored the Father in ways that Israel, God's son, had never done. Let's read this one more time. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, Jesus. Obey this perfectly, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. 
this command defined Israel, yet we find out later in history that they failed and were exiled from the land. But we see no such thing in the life of Jesus. He obeyed perfectly, yet on the cross, his life was cut short. It did not go well with him. On the cross, he was orphaned. He was exiled from life in the land with no inheritance, with no friendships, with no community, with no home, with no father. You know why he did it. So that you can live long in the land for all eternity. It might go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So that you'll never lose sight of your father. You'll never go without a community. That you'll never have to go, go without a family or go without a home ever again. If you would allow a church community, a restorative community to form you in this way, to calibrate you regularly, to remind you of who you were, slaves, of where you are. We're still in the wilderness and where we're going to an eternal promised land. And you would know and be reminded and ingrained in your heart that this came at the cost of Jesus Christ who was exiled to give you a land, who was orphaned to give you a father. If you realize that he gave his life for the benefit of, co of a community, this can change you and empower you so that you yourself can give your life to the community. Oh, how the world is waiting for the sons of God to rise up in righteousness in this way. I'm telling you, we have enough number in this space today that if all of you would rise up to righteousness, a wave of righteousness come, come to the city that our city that's broken will never be able to recover. I pray that you rise up as a, an army of God. I, I have a couple of, of slides here for you to think. Maybe you just take a photo of it and talk about it with your family. I promise you it will be of much benefit to your heart and your family. The first meditation point is this, and then we'll segue, segue to communion. I have meditation points here for you. Knowing the fruit will not fall far from the tree, what can you resolve to change? Knowing that you're living in a glass house for your children and your subordinates. What can you change for the glory of God? How have you been living a me first life and what can you resolve to do? If not the people of God, who will? Pastor Gus was right. The world is counting on us and they don't even know. And the second part is how can we be honoring our parents? These are four words that you can say to your parents today if you still have them. If you still have them, don't text, call, visit. When you, when, especially when you're a child, you say, yes, mom. Yes, dad. Okay, can we have it up in, on this? Yes, it's one of the most beautiful things that they're able to hear. It, it honors them. Even if you're old, older, find every opportunity that you can say yes make them happy say it when was the last time that you said thank you you need to know this that the parents one of the best things for the parents to know whether or not they've lived a righteous life or not is something that you are today for the good of the community because of them you know dad because of you I still remember when we were young you did this and it always carried me it always carried this with me that's why I'm like this today I want to honor you for that thank you when was the last time that you did this the third is, I'm sorry. Maybe you're estranged. You're a Christian. Jesus makes it so clear. If you are estranged and you're not meeting eye to eye, you, whatever the case, sila nang agrabyado, ikaw nang agrabyado, you go first. I'm sorry. Hindi, I never did anything. They'll think that I did all of the wrong, so I'm admitting it. Let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. You, magpakumbaba ka na. Ang Panginoon ang nagpakumbaba, wala siyang ginawa para maligtas ka lang, para maging anak ng Diyos, ang buti ng Panginoon. And you can reflect it in this way. Lastly, hello. Some of you need to say hello today. 
because it's been a while and they miss you. As we take up our communion, can, can I, if you're able, can I ask you to stand on your feet, please? Jesus took our place on the cross for our sins so that He can be our Savior. He's the one who took all of the consequences of our sins that should have resulted in us being homeless and fatherless. But do you know how it sounded like for Him to take our place? When Jesus prayed to the Father, it had always been Father in heaven. But on the cross, He could not call on the Father in heaven as His Father. He could, a Father is supposed to bring provision and rescue and protection. See, at the Father, at the cross, the Father cannot be Father to Jesus. He cannot provide protection. He cannot provide provision because He was the provision. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a metaphorical sense, but it is a true sense that goes deep into my heart at least. He lost his father so that I can have a father in heaven. So we can have ours as well. As we take up our bread, our father in heaven, thank you that you've counted the cost and did something for us that we ourselves would probably never have done for us. We'll never understand whether if there's anything, we thank you. Ang buti mo sa amin, Panginoon, for taking us from being enemies of the cross and slaves to your children, no less. Salamat po. We are forever grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Can we partake of the bread? And as we hold the cup, we say, Jesus, thank you that you have allowed your body to be broken to be bruised and your blood to be poured out even unto death so that we wouldn't have to face death. Thank you that you said that though we die, yet we shall live and have this eternal promised land in our future. We are truly blessed in the heavenly places in this and this we are forever grateful. We thank you, we love you, we pray this in your name. You're the God of our salvation. Father, thank you for thinking and initiating script, the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for being born as us so that you can do things for us, accomplishing the gospel. And thank you, Spirit, that even today, you are still working in us so that we can grow in Christ-likeness, not just for our family's benefit, but for the benefit of the culture and the society that surrounds us. Would you bless us for your mighty namesake, would you bless us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.